Truth Out podcast about things you should know if you want to change the world. I'm your host, writer and organizer, Kelly Hayes. We talk a lot on this show about organizing and what solidarity demands of us. Well, this week, we will be tackling those topics with one of my favorite people, scholar, activist, and author Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Ruthie's work, including her book, Golden Gulag, has had a profound impact on my own analysis and activism. Some of you may be familiar with her often cited definition of racism as the state-sanctioned and or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Ruthie's new book, Abolition Geography, Essays Towards Liberation, includes work created over the course of 30 years of study, organizing, and struggle. Ruthie and I had a great conversation last week about the ways that organizers map and transform the world. As I was telling a friend today, when I like a book, I tweet about it. And when I don't like a book, I message Ruthie about it. Lately, I have been making my way through an advanced copy of Ruthie's latest book, Abolition Geography, and I am just so grateful for this wealth of knowledge and analysis amassed over the course of so much learning, teaching, and doing. In an essay called Race and Space, Ruthie wrote, If justice is embodied, it is then therefore always spatial, which is to say part of the process of making a place. I have always appreciated Ruthie's assertion that Prison abolition is about making things. In abolitionist organizing, we foster new relations, developing new configurations of care and justice-making that demand, rehearse, and manifest the world we want. Prison abolition is about making a world composed of everything we are denied when security is presented as the solution to all ills. So I really wanted to hear more about this idea of justice-making as the work of making a place. What I find the most exciting about being a geographer is thinking about how we make the world and make the world and make the world. That's the most exciting thing to me. And that the concept of place, which for many people, understandably enough, seems only to mean location. Oh, I'm in this place and you're in that place. Has actually a dynamic, expansive fullness to it that I love to think about. So when trying to figure out how in South Central Los Angeles or Central California or peripheral Lisbon or peripheral Durban, how people are making the world, one of the sort of key things that I have come to think about is how they are making place. And this is not original to me. This is like just geography thing, on a capital G geography thing, how people are making place. And so it occurred to me, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, to realize that freedom is a place. It's not like a destination, it's the place that we make. So, I mean, it might be a time destination, but it might be like under your feet already, if not made. And by making the place, we then enable ourselves, depending on how we configure ourselves and the kinds of expectations and rules and dependencies that we embrace, we we make it possible to share that freedom by sharing space. That, you know, 
every embodied consciousness who joins together in that struggle is then joining together, at least provisionally, in being free there, like wherever the there is. Is it the Republic of New Africa? Is it where the water protectors set up a camp? Is it something smaller or bigger? Is it a little co-op? Is it the mutual aid group that your people have been circulating through since the pandemic started? Wherever it is. A place need not be geometrically unbroken, that it could, you know, be an archipelago in which people, you know, at each of the, we might say, same elevations are doing the same thing. I'm speaking metaphorically. So my friend Cindy Katz calls thinking this way a counter topography. So, you know, topo maps show the heights and depths of the surface of the of the earth. And so if we think of that, as it were, metaphorically, then we can think, oh, all of us who are kind of at the same elevation or same depression are somehow not only engaged in similar practices and processes, but we can both imagine ourselves combined and then do the work of literally combining our struggles. In our conversations about prisons, criminalization, and the climate crisis, Ruthie and I talk a lot about extraction, because it is the violence of extraction that is killing imprisoned people, the natural world, and all of us as we live and breathe in a collapsing biosphere. Extraction and bordering are the drivers of the apocalypse, and they are also shaping our experience of this catastrophic era. Many people frame prison abolition within a larger, generalized arc in which chattel slavery and U.S. prisons are part of a single, continuous process, making the struggles to abolish them different eras of the same movement. I personally grew into this work with that perspective, but by reading Ruthie's work, I came to understand the prison industrial complex as a distinct mechanism that must be countered on its own terms. The majority of imprisoned people do not have jobs in their facilities. Many are not allowed to work, and notably, when jobs for imprisoned people are eliminated, no one is set free. Because the extraction of labor is not the primary function of prisons. As Ruthie taught me, people are extracted from our communities, and then the defining resource of life itself, time, is extracted from the extracted. Time is stripped from the territory of selves. I've been thinking and rethinking a lot about extraction for some years, many, many years, in fact. And in, oddly enough, I came to that particular focus, not by way of a certain thread of Latin American political economic criticism, which is where a lot of it arose in the last 30 years, the extractivists. So people like Jim Petras and and so forth. But rather because in studying a lot about rural America, actually rural United States, actually, I had been thinking about how so much rural economic activity is indeed extractive. I mean, technically speaking, it's farming or mining or logging. It's extractive. And the kinds of relationships that people have to extractive activities make for sometimes a different sense of place and political possibility than for people who work in urban environments, whatever their work is, whether they're building things, cleaning things, fixing things, teaching people, driving buses, you know, whatever they do, there's a a kind of different sense of placemaking. 
and here I'm not like drawing a sharp line between the city and the country because we know that they are completely interdependent no matter what. We know this, but rather just thinking as hard as I could about what kinds of uh, consciousnesses and possibilities have arisen in the context of rural, which is to say not very urban United States that has led to, on the one hand, the proliferation of prisons and jails, but also on the other hand, a lot of really radical work against them. What is it? What is it? How are people tied and not tied to place, whether because of what they do, their work or their love of it or something else? How do people uh, move around between and among different levels of surveillance and the state, capitalists hostile to union organizing, the state ready to criminalize people not documented to work, et cetera, et cetera. And how do those things come together in really strong, if relatively local movements to undo what we've come to call mass incarceration. And the people who are working to undo it have very much in the front of their minds, not in their back of their minds, how criminalization regimes are part of what constrain and threaten their lives regardless of their individual relation with the criminal justice system. Like they see that the bigger picture is, is really there. So it was really in the context of all of that that I got to thinking about how so many people who I've become very close comrades with over time, some of whom have passed, I mean, this is a long time we're talking about, were farm workers, let's say. And so they were working in extractive industries and because of, for example, their exposures to pesticides and arsenic that is poison the water table in, in some regions of, for example, California, they're being killed by the extractive activities almost directly. And so it was the combination of all those things that made me think, oh, aha, what prison is and unfreedom is, is the extraction of time. That explains a lot to me in terms of how time itself becomes monetized, no less than a grape or a ball of cotton or, you know, a stand of trees or the cobalt under the ground or anything else that comes from extractive activities. So that's how I got to extraction. And then I happened to give a talk about 14 years ago, 12 or 14 years ago, and said, blah, blah, here, it, in my view, what's happening with uh, prison and unfreedom is the extraction of the one non-renewable resource, time. And all these people in the audience said, oh, oh, this is so interesting that you're connecting with Latin American thinking and indigenous thinking and so forth. And I said, that is really great. And I can't take credit for that. <laughs> but I'm glad we all met in this same area of thought, of political thought. Like, very glad of that. So it, it, to the extent that, you know, you have any interest in exploring some of these connections, which I think give us the opportunity not just to dwell in the local of specific rural political economic environments, but also to stretch across the globe and think about how extraction and displacement connect both in terms of exasperating climate crisis, in terms of pushing people out of their living places and into vulnerability that results in detention, deportation, and death, as well as the kind of incredible struggles that people have engaged in to uh, restrict and stop the kind of extractivism that is 
killing the planet and all of us, whether it's water protectors or people trying to figure out how to reconfigure the the economy in most of the continent of Africa, a place that is filthy rich with natural resources and filthy poor in terms of racial capitalism or anybody's capitalism, make some connections or land theft, land grabbing in, in Brazil, where again, the prevalence of people killed by cops and locked up in prisons is very high uh, as people are displaced from land. It's also true in many other places that, that, that all of these connections, I think, give us some view into thinking about abolition on a global scale without becoming too abstracted from the actual struggles people are actually engaged in on the ground. I can't speak for most geographers on the planet, although I think we recognize each other in, you know, certain tools and and approaches that we share in, in thinking about how humans write the world. And I don't mean write about the world, but make it. Like we make it, in that sense, write the world. And one of the concepts that we geographers share and also dispute the meaning of is the concept of scale. And while for some people, including some geographers, scale amounts to nothing greater, more than size, you know, bigger scale, smaller scale. Or if you think of what a cartographer does, a map maker does, is that they, you know, examine the terrain that they want to represent in two dimensions. And then they figure out the scale so that you can see things in proportion one to the other. So those are two ways of thinking scale. There is another way of thinking scale that I learned from my now late doctoral advisor, a guy called Neil Smith, who died 10 years ago, who proposed as just something to work with in thinking not as this is how things are for all time, but he proposed a typology of scale for us to think with. And he said, what if we thought about scale as in, in capitalist society, so not in all human society for all time, but under the capitalist mode of production, what if we thought about scale as a kind of series of configurations of people, places, and things that capitalism exploits in order to reproduce itself, but which therefore are con constructed of contradictions, which means we can seriously think about how to counter-exploit in the context of contradiction and perhaps do something else. All right, so that's all quite abstract. Let me make it a bit more concrete. So 30 years ago or so, Neil worked out a typology of scales and he kind of went from the body to the global. And there are a bunch in between. So it's not just local, global. There's body and home. Whether or not somebody has a house, people have a sense of something called home, which has certain contradictions inherent into it. Community, the urban regions, nation states, which continue to be, you know, pretty powerful actors, the first among equals being the United States still. And then the global system, which is not the entire planet, but global systems that capitalism can put together through global corporations, through global NGOs, through trade agreements, like the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and so forth. All of this give us some sense of scale. And therefore, we can think about what it would take to weaken 
the domination of capitalism in a particular place, if we're mindful of the scale and what the opportunities and constraints might be, that capitalism is working through or against or trying to skirt. All right, so far, so good. So I want to go back to like the first scale that I mentioned, which is the scale of the body. When you think of the body as one of the series of kinds of places. So the home is a kind of place. The community is a kind of place. The region is a kind of place. It might be subnational. It might be trans or international. A uh, nation state we know is a kind of place. It doesn't mean that all nation states are equal, but it is a kind of place. It has certain characteristics. And the global, again, for various sectors of capitalism and war making and so forth. Yet again, kind of place. Back to the body. So if the body is a place, then that means something that we all always know, but maybe don't think about in the front of our mind. And that that is each of us and all of us are time space. That's what it is to be alive, time space. Body held together by skin, the largest organ, so much time, whatever it is, or so little. And the extraction of time from people who are detained, captured, disappeared, incarcerated, is the annihilation of space by time, which is something that nappy-haired philosopher Karl Marx said in the middle of the 19th century, capitalism was busily doing to the planet, annihilating space by time. And so in taking back time in the various ways that we can provisionally is indeed part of the anti-capitalist struggle when it is part of the anti-capitalist struggle. Rather than understanding time in mere countable units, some indigenous cultures measure time in life events, relationships, and seasonal changes. Some understand time as being fundamentally related to place. Runa communities of Ecuador believe in the concept of a living future, wherein the future is interlinked with practices of everyday life and also rooted in a person's spiritual connection to animals and the natural world. Such understandings of time underline what's being extracted from imprisoned people. Not abstract units of measurement, but their human experience of other people, places, and beings that are the stuff of life itself. On my own reservation early in the pandemic, Elders in a local women's group told members to view social distancing as a form of fasting, a time to abstain from togetherness and contemplate what they had made of their time with others up to now and what they would make of it in the future. To me, the idea of giving up time with one's community as a form of fasting, because we are indeed social beings nourished by human interaction highlights the reality that the forced isolation and prison people experience is a form of social and spiritual starvation, a siphoning away of life. In a variety of ways, capitalism is stripping us all of time. Labor, the years that pollution and contamination rip away from us, the ongoing climate catastrophes that could end or displace any of us at any time. Many people experience such losses steadily without reconciling what's being taken from them or that a system and its operators are directly responsible for that theft. Meanwhile, people who are acutely aware of what is being stolen from us 
who are fighting to curb the damage are being punished and isolated. Water protectors, for example, are being hypercriminalized with outlandish charges. In retaliation for their efforts to halt extraction, they are being extracted from their communities, isolated, as time is extracted from their lives by the carceral state. I wanted to hear Ruthie's thoughts on the connectivity between the extractive forces that are shaving years off of humanity's potential time on Earth and the experience of resistors gripped by an intensified form of that extraction within the prison industrial complex. Well, you know, you just said it perfectly. There is, for anybody who is caught up in these systems that are shaped by extractive capitalism and organized violence, there is a cumulative and compounded effect on their persons and their lives. So let me say this in a third way, talking about, let's say, air pollution. For a very long time in the United States, in spite of the Environmental Protection Act, which was, and actually to this day still is, one of the few federal laws that if enforced, does not have to prove that a perpetrator of a harm intended the harm. It only has to show the harm occurred. And in almost all other law relating to racism, sexism, and so on and so forth, civil rights, voting rights, the standard against uh, which people who have harmed others must be judged is, did they intend to do it? So we see that in the recent cases that have come before the United States Supreme Court about voting rights, which let me remind you, a lot of people died for this shit 100 years ago. You don't have to believe in voting, solving things to take seriously. This is like, this was life or death and can easily be understood to continue to be life and death. The uh, New U.S. Supreme Court saying, well, if the, if the legislatures of these, of these state governments that are restricting access to ballot boxes to people in poor communities, communities of color and so forth, haven't said that's what they intended, they cannot be held responsible for the effect. Now, this is different or has been different for environmental harms. And so what spurred and motivated a lot of people to very good organizing, starting with Bob Bullard's Dumping in Dixie expose of how environmental racism was encountered with impunity by these big corporations throwing lead and, you know, you name it, various carcinogens. Uh, into people's water tables and so on and so forth. People organizing against environmental racism came together to make lots of demands in lots of different kinds of situations. And in these, in these encounters where I met lots of people over the years, we would learn that the officials who were judging whether or not the environmental harms produced by one or two or three or many capitalist firms were indeed causing premature death in workers and people who lived in the environment. What I found, not surprisingly, is the kinds of studies that the decision makers were relying on were not studies at all. They were, they were kind of, you know, bullshit charts and graphs. And so I would show up, Dr. Gilmore geographer in a suit and <laughs> say, now, 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 this, this study that you just presented that says that these people who are sitting in the audience, you say are dying of these things. And they say they are dying of these things. Well, your study doesn't show anything. And under the Environmental Protection Act, we're going to push against that study and demand that you do the right kind. 
And one air quality management district science guy said to me, for the record, you are correct, Professor Gilmore, but the kind of study you think we should do is too difficult. So that's why we don't do it. And it's just a study that shows cumulative effects. If you have a, a hypothetical, which is to say a statistical child born on day zero, what happens to them if they're exposed to this toxin, let's say uh, polyvinyl chloride, over time? You could say, well, they'll make it to 70 without dying because the healthy infant will have enough to withstand these negative effects. And you say, yeah, but this healthy infant lives in a place where pesticides, tire fires, arsenic in the water, low birth weight because of nutritional problems going back at least a generation, et cetera, means that the cumulative effects of all of these environmental hazards suggest that child born on day zero is not going to make it to year 11, much less year 70, not even to year 11. And this kind of thinking, understanding cumulative causation, let us say, is what I think lots of um, people who are doing abolition work even if they don't call themselves abolitionists, are trying to achieve. They are making the time, if you will, to think about what you described so well, that people who are vulnerable because of the conditions under which they grew up, the conditions under which they are fighting, the conditions produced by pipelines and so on and so forth, are also then experiencing cumulative harm by being put into lockups or into an ankle shackle or otherwise deprived of their freedom means that the time extracted from their time space being is going faster, is going faster and therefore premature death, whether it happens when they're 70 or 60 or 12 is still something that was preventable. That was preventable. And that is the definition of premature death. About eight or nine years ago, a little girl, a daughter of immigrants to London, died of asthma. And her name was Ella. She was nine years old. And her parents and some other people who were in the kind of environmental justice and fighting against climate change community in greater London just said, we are not satisfied with the explanation for Ella's death. Yes, she died of asthma. Why did she die of asthma? What made it lethal for her? And they fought and fought and fought and fought and continually demanded that the chief medical examiner for London, I think they're called a coroner, reopen the case and look at different kinds of data, different kinds of studies, and especially take seriously the fact that Ella grew up in a in an apartment, you know, parents of modest income people, very near to a, a highway, a motorway, a, a big one, one of the big post-World War II motorways built in, in London. And about a year and a half ago, the coroner ruled that the reason this little girl died was because of the level of pollution produced by the automobiles on that motorway. And the fact that even though the city of London in the country, the UK, have very strict levels, acceptable levels and expected controls on this sort of pollution, 
none of that was ever enforced. And so in her short life, there was some astonishing number of days that the crap spewed out by the vehicles on this road far exceeded in parts per million the kind of crap that somebody with the kind of delicate lungs that she had could withstand. And it killed her. Now, as it turns out, when I, Professor Gilmore, was studying the question of air quality and air quality management in California under different circumstances, but for the same purpose, to interrupt vulnerability to premature death, I got to know a number of environmental scientists who specialize in the vulnerability of children's lungs to these kinds of harms and who were particularly taken as researchers to understand why there are asthma epidemics when asthma, again, shouldn't kill anybody. So some people might be prone to it, but nobody should die of it. It's something that with steroids is reasonably quickly, easily treated. Steroids pr produce their own downsides sometimes, but nobody should die of this. And yet the epidemic exists. It exists mostly among poor children, whether they are red, white, yellow, brown, black, poor children suffer from it. And the studies showing the relationship between and among children, childhood asthma, proximity to freeways, and the fact that uh, children who are signed girl at birth are the most vulnerable, those studies have been completed 20 years before this little girl died. Like, it's not like the knowledge isn't there. Is that her parents' fault? Of course not. But here again is the question of the murderous relation that unchecked capitalist development, fossil fuel dependence, automotive transport, and so forth have on little lives as well as the lives of the entire planet. We can, we can see it. And we can, as it were, scale it. And then we can ask ourselves questions like, is scale here the problem? Is it a problem that not just a matter of the absence of knowledge, because it could very well be that the people who are the bosses of managing this problem in the city of London knew all the same research I did, and they just didn't care. I mean, that is an eminently possible explanation but of course, it's also true that solidarity that can build across communities, those who have experienced these tragedies and those who do not want to ever experience these tragedies, gives us a view into how it's possible maybe to jump scales and have really strong solidarity between and among people who are in California and in Sao Paulo and in Durban and in London, coming together in common purpose in the fight against the use of fossil fuels and the fight for, you know, the lives of children and adults and elders. I am going to briefly interrupt us with a pre-recorded fundraising appeal because Truthout is a nonprofit news organization and the vast majority of our funding comes from readers and listeners like you. We've experienced a bit of a slowdown in donations recently, which may have something to do with Facebook ramping down engagement with political content. But we are still here delivering award-winning independent journalism. We are a union shop, and we have not laid anyone off during the pandemic, and our family and sick leave policies are the best in the industry. So if you believe in what we do, please consider stopping by truthout.org to make a donation today. I have heard a lot of people talk about feeling 
listless or adrift in this political moment. There is an ominous uncertainty in the air, and I do not want to downplay what's at stake or what people are likely to endure in the coming years. But we have to remember that the world is much bigger than our particular fears or frustrations about what is or isn't happening. Deeply powerful work is unfolding all around the world, and it is our duty in this moment to learn all we can from people who are taking bold and effective collective action. I appreciate that throughout the pandemic, Ruthie has urged us to learn from people who are doing life-giving work. So where, where I've been kind of had my, had my political imagination focused a lot in recent years is on what already organized people do. Whether they call themselves abolitionists or not, doesn't matter to me. If I can see in their principles and programs something that is at least tending toward non-reformist reform, that also has the stretch and resonance necessary to help all kinds of people not be or feel isolated in their struggles. So those things. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the people I've been talking about nonstop since the pandemic started, the MST. The MST, the uh, Landless uh, Workers Movement, Rural Workers Movement in Brazil, that has been around for 38 years, that has managed in incredibly hostile and in the face of organized violence, malicious, as well as, you know, the organized violence in the state, to achieve land occupations, establish villages, establish schools, grow the biggest amount of organic rice produced anywhere in Latin America is produced by MST, send cadres out through the world, not only, but mostly through the global South, but also to places like Detroit and Mississippi, to work with people on the ground to make the earth that that they have some control over fruitful, organizing against uh, land grabbing and land thefts everywhere, working in close cooperation with the Atempsina and, and others. Sam Whale Institute that's based in Kenya, 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 and so forth. All right, so MST is one. In recent years, one of the things that MST has done is establish a greater presence than it had had in urban areas, partly in, in Brazil, partly because the difficulties of the pandemic, as you know very well from people's experience in Chicago and beyond has left a lot of people really hungry, but also because the movement of people across the earth's surface has uh, resulted, as we know, in a lot of people without documentation arriving somewhere and needing to be uh, secure there for a while before they continue their journey. So people moving, for example, from Cameroon and other places in Africa have arrived in Brazil and they're on their way to like Minneapolis or Toronto, right? That they, they have a destination that's hard to get through because the U.S. and Canada have outsourced, you know, detention services to Mexico and Guatemala and so on and so forth. So this is the MST and and comrades working in collaboration with vulnerable people who are on the move, as well as vulnerable people in the favelas of Rio and Sao Paulo, who, again, are perhaps in need of shelter and certainly in need of food. So these are things that are happening that to me say, ah, this is abolition. And as I said, it doesn't matter to me that the central cadre or any member of MST says we are abolitionists. That's what I see. 
That's what I see. This is also true for a lot of the self-organizing communities in, in South Africa, sometimes called, you know, shack dwellers or quote unquote slum dwellers. But anyway, people build their own communities and then live there and figure out how to make an entire life. So there are people, for example, from MST who will circle through and help people in Durban make the land fruitful. But also there are people who are in more kind of institutionally formal and secure positions, like the people at the African Center for Cities, which is based at the University of Cape Town, that are constantly trying to figure out how to, as it were, extend those fundamental infrastructural services that everybody needs, clean water and power, to such communities without doing the kind of mid 20th century planner move of saying the way we made your life better is we knock down what you built and then we'll build something new. And given that that is not either a possibility nor in many cases desirable, how then to, to work with people in communities to convert what they have to what they need. So those are, those are some examples. And while I think a feeling of despair in this day and age is not difficult to understand, I also feel that, you know, as my grandparents taught me, that despair was a luxury that I didn't get to sport. And any number of people might be listening at this moment and say, but Gilmore, you're a professor, you got a job, you got a roof over your head. This is all true. This is all true. I'm not denying any of that. And yet I still take seriously what I learned as a child, which is despair is a luxury. I am not. I just don't. I don't have a right to. We have talked in the past on this show about the corporate funding of police repression and how, thanks to Enbridge, corporations are now positioned to purchase the state security they need to carry out any action the public might object to. In Minnesota, Enbridge poured millions of dollars into field force trainings, police equipment, surveillance of water protectors via drones and helicopters, and the arrest and torture of protesters all for the sake of ensuring that construction of Line 3 was completed. An astonishing wave of felony charges were also leveled against protesters, and it has since been revealed that a lead prosecutor believed Enbridge would be footing the bill for those cases. I believe in and support the movement to defund the police, but as Miriam Kappa says, defund is the floor. I believe that while we support efforts to defund the police, we need to keep having bigger conversations about escalating language and expansive ideas that can help people understand what we're up against. Under capitalism, corporate violence and state violence easily blur, and we should expect that trend to continue. So how do we talk about what we are up against? How do we explore and explain it? Ruthie had some thoughts on that as well. As we know, the relationship between large-scale capitalist activity and the forces of organized violence have been intimate for the entire history of capitalism, which has always been racial capitalism. So if we study things like the British East India Company or the Dutch East India Company or the Royal African Company or the Dutch West Indies Company and so on and so forth. The Russian company that grabbed Alaska a couple of centuries ago. We study them, we see two things that happened consistently. One, 
the uh, sovereign authority that gave a license to those companies to go engage in trade and terror did so with the agreement that those companies could either conduct their own practices of warfare, i.e. have their own internal forces of organized violence, or depend on the military of that imperial formation to achieve those goals. And one of the strange shifts that occurred from the beginning of the, well, really the middle of the 15th century, so before 1492, from the middle of the 15th century until the mid-late 19th century is in the shift in uh, the forms of warfare and treaty that the imperial powers engaged in, they gradually, but not completely, absorbed organized violence to their own array of institutions and possibilities. Now, the way a lot of people talk about this today is the state monopolizes violence. Eh, that's not telling us enough. And let's not get all excited about Weber because Weber was a racist, like he was such a racist. So yes and no. What, what Weber actually teaches us, that old racist, is what the state does is it monopolizes the delegation of legitimate violence. So the state doesn't need to come in the house and say marital rape is fine, but if the state ever prosecutes marital rape, they have delegated legitimate violence, right? As one example, or the state engages militias or Eric Prince's private armies or so on and so forth. That's another way. Or stand your ground laws, right? All of, all of these are examples of the delegation of violence. And yet that kind of fundamental relationship remains intact. And that is for the accumulation of value under capitalism to proceed, the inviolability of a certain understanding of property must be intact. So not any old kind of property, not, is that your shirt? It's your shirt. I don't, I mean, I might want it, but it's yours. I recognize that. <laughs> so the inviolability of a certain kind of property must proceed. And the only way that that inviolability has maintained its force over time has been through the forces of organized violence standing between that concept of property and everybody else. Like that, that is it. So that means that not only can Enright turn to a public entity of organized violence to defend, to secure their particular version of property, but also it means that if we, again, look at, say, the continent of Africa, a vast area that is replete with many kinds of natural resources, we see that the organized forces of violence of the states of Nigeria and, and a number of other states also step up and intervene murderously between people struggling to make their livings and make their lives and the large-scale corporations, whether local or transnational, who are extracting oil from Nigeria or diamonds or gold from South Africa or cobalt from the DRC and so forth. So we see this as a pattern on the world scale. So it seems that when we 
think about, as we must, what the police are doing in their militarized role, rather than, as was the kind of vogue a few years ago, to keep on talking about how urban police departments have tanks or whatever, whatever, it, it seems like it's time again to see the unbroken continuum between military that's sent outside of the territorial boundaries of wherever and the kinds of extreme violent control happening within and put that together again with our understanding of capitalism as it is currently constituting itself in the context of global struggle. And those global struggles have so many different attributes. One has to do with the U.S. is still the power. It's the power because it has more air power in its military than any other of these countries that also have nuclear weapons. The U.S. has more air power. The U.S. sells weapons around the world, which means that any, anybody that wants to be in a trade relation with the U.S. is often constrained to purchase U.S. weapons as a condition of trading, you know, whatever the thing might be, wheat or phones or shoes. The third is that in the last 25 or 30 years in the kind of the rollout of the assassination of whatever remained of the U.S. welfare state and the expansion of U.S. military power as well as so-called soft power around the world. The U.S. has established many new bases. And from what I understand, they're the biggest drone base uh, that the U.S. has is based on the continent of Africa. It, I mean, the drones fly everywhere, but that's where it's based. So, you know, all of these considerations make us see that the political economy of the military industrial complex, the imperial reach of the United States that is coming up against the imperial reach of Russia and China, and also the burgeoning big, but not as big economies of Brazil and India is, you know, in this struggle in which we see fascism rising as a kind of generally accepted form of organization, warfare that is, you know, constantly, 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 constantly pummeling people in the various proxy war arenas, Yemen and so forth, no less than Ukraine. And also that finally the forces of organized violence, while very much tied to military uniforms, weapons, industrialized killing in that way, what Rosa Luxemburg called organized murder, also has another side to it, which is not in itself new, but we can all see it so starkly now. And that is that the organized abandonment that we have discussed quite a few times over the years that characterizes why and how, for example, people throughout the U.S., have become more and more precarious, also flicks through the same logic, which is the logic of organized death dealing. People in Afghanistan today whose assets have been frozen and so who are literally starving, or people in Iraq who, because of a number of asset seizures and, and embargoes, have been starving. The people of Venezuela who are behind a wall of embargo, and although MST can slide some food under that wall, they are starving. And of course, the longest standing embargo of the 
last hundred and some odd years, and that's the embargo of Cuba. So the economic sanctions and embargoes are no less expressions of organized violence that result in premature death than the military incursions. And I just read a piece by a guy called Tom Stevenson, who writes for maybe the London Review of Books or something, I forget what, who, who quotes somebody he talked to as saying, you know, one of the things that these economic sanctions do is not only make it impossible for people to get food and other necessities, to engage in trade, or even like to take their money out of the bank. I mean, just imagine if you had no recourse to anything. This is, this is what it is. This interlocutor of Stevenson said, yes, and the, one of the purposes of these economic sanctions is actually not only to punish people who are suffering under the sanctions, but also to prepare the polity that is perpetrating the sanctions for the necessity of going to war. Because what they will say is, sanctions against Iran didn't work. We have to bomb them. Sanctions against Syria didn't work. We have to bomb. Sanctions against the, you know, breakaway, whoever, whoever, whoever in the Horn of Africa haven't worked. We have to bomb. And so these wars, most of which are not on TV, like the Ukraine war or the Iraq war. I mean, even Afghanistan was not on TV very much. But the, these wars are constantly being waged and they're waged both with the alleged soft power, which is absolutely lethal, of economic sanction as well as military. So these are all things we have to put together when we're saying defund is the floor, is to think about that word fund and think about all of its various ramifications in how our political imagination can work it through. When I was reading Abolition Geography, I came across a mind-blowing story about Ruthie and Angela Davis visiting a prison together, and how Black women prison guards crowded around Dr. Davis in the restroom to thank her for opening doors for them. The story, and its stinging contradictions, reminded me of how conversations around representation tend to simplify what our movements have fought for, and what organizers like Dr. Davis have endured, and to what end. I asked Ruthie about that moment and what it was like to watch that contradiction unfold in real time. That was a really heavy moment. Heavy, heavy, way out in the desert the Sonora Desert in Southern California, like way out. We'd been in a minivan for hours to get to this prison and we finally get in. The warden, who is a really diminutive Chicana, wearing not uniform because wardens wear street clothes, and uh, welcomed us to her conference room, uh, scalded us about how uh, we better not go away from there and criticize their way of life. She said, we like going to Costco. And it was actually a good warning. Like, I don't know you people, but if you go away and say, all those poor benighted prison employees, they think their lives are good because they get to go to Costco, you will not have convinced us of anything because we're really happy with our lives. Now you can tour the prison and we don't have enough vests for you you know, uh, stab-proof vest for you to wear. So you're going to have to decide which of you is going to wear a vest. And we have a no hostage policy. So if you're taken hostage, sorry. It was like, it was very trippy. Anyway, so that was like our introduction. And then Angela and I went to the, went to the ladies' room to powder our noses. And that's when the guards came rushing in. So there were Black women guards who were just so dazzled. And, you know, and I am always invisible in these encounters, always have been. It was like, there were not two tall Black women of a certain age in this room. There was one, and it was she, and that is appropriate. 
And they were just really, really happy. And because she is the most gracious human being on earth, she didn't say, are you crazy? She said, oh, thank you very much. It's nice to meet you too. And, and, I, and I thought then, and I continue to think that it is an unfortunate fact of everyday consciousness in the U.S. because of its racism and its sexism, that somehow the mere fact of representation is what the entire struggle has been for. That if people know about a world historical figure like Angela Y. Davis, it's because somehow, in spite of the dramatic story of her coming to national prominence, arrest, FBI most on it, and in spite of the actual things that she's written and said over time, that somehow all Angela Y. Davis was trying to do was, you know, get a spot in the university or become something that would reproduce rather than interrupt the kinds of social relations that made her and her parents radical in the first place. So there's that. So if we kind of draw forward from when 1970, 71, when again, Angela was suddenly catapulted to the global stage and was, as she said, her, says herself, saved by the people. Through time, we see that in, in the right in the early 90s, for example, when Clarence Thomas was being interviewed for his seat on the Supreme Court and Anita Hill came forward, all these people were uh, having a hard time understanding why Black people should not support Clarence Thomas because since Thurgood Marshall was no longer on the court, we needed to have our guy on the court. And it was like, no, we need to, no, but it was hard. It was really, 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 really hard. And then by contrast, at that time, a lot of people thought, oh, well, then anything and everything Anita Hill says, we have to be in support of. If she's against Claire Son, it's like, no, no, neither, neither. And, you know, a bunch of us, I forget how many, you know, took out an ad in the New York Times saying African-American women in defense of ourselves. And it's, a, it's an artifact. You can find it. And, you know, Angela signed it. I signed it. And the point was not that, therefore, Anita Hill was our new political leader. It was like, we recognized a certain kind of harm that we wanted to have taken seriously. It was like that straightforward. And then we come forward to, you know, current years. And what do we see? We see that the mayor of Chicago is a police officer and the mayor of the city of New York is a police officer. In both cases, they are black police officers and they will with straight faces say, but this is an opportunity that I seize and others should seize. Why do you petulant people not want black people like us to have the kind of success that a good paying, high respect city job affords us. This is the area of conflict where I can see very clearly a lot of people feel torn. People who are unalterably opposed to people like Breonna Taylor and Eric Garner and, and George Floyd and so on being slaughtered in their beds and slaughtered in the streets still hold out that somehow the respect and authority that comes with that uniform is something that Black people and other marginalized people should want and can transform. And when we say, no, the transformation has got to be actually broader and deeper, the response is that we are out of our minds, even though the possibility 
of a black person carrying a gun in that way actually was a pretty great transformation. And I don't mean good, I mean big transformation in the order of power and difference in the United States. So, I mean, this, this is the mess we're trying to find our way through. Just as we try to find our way through the mess of thinking, will Judge Jackson being on the Supreme Court undo the things that the Supreme Court is doing? Well, it won't because one, the Supreme Court is balanced or unbalanced the way it is, but two, because Judge Jackson's agenda is not an abolitionist agenda. Of course it's not, you know? What, whatever good, decent things Judge Jackson might do, you know, in her community life, I don't know. So there's the huge question of representation. The notion somehow that if there are enough different faces, let's say, I was going to say black faces and high places, different faces and high places, that somehow this representation is going to be the catalyst for fundamental change. And that somehow then at the end of the day, if we just are patient for another 550 years, things are going to work out. Like this, the, this, is, this is the thinking. So here, here's something that, that I was talking with a student about the other day that might be interesting to you. I've been thinking about the fact that the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade, that particular phase of abolition, and I'm waving my fingers around to show scarecrows. The abolition of the Atlantic slave trade, which as you know, Britain, which then had the most powerful Navy on the high seas, took the lead in enforcing, was a police action. That's what it was. It was a police action. It was a very complex police action that involved British ships that were faster and, and, and could change direction and so forth more easily than the slave ships. It involved establishing towns, bases, in Western Africa, West and West Central Africa, where the intercepted uh, slave ships would be brought, right? And then the people who were in those ships would be freed, but they weren't freed. They had to stay where they were. Sometimes they were compelled in some places to live in these, you know, kind of enclosed com uh, environments where they couldn't just like, make their way home if they had some place they could make their way to. Were they all abject and suffering? No, of course, people, you know, made, made their lives as it could, sometimes sorting themselves or resorting themselves into linguistic communities. In some cases, there were communities that were actually multilingual and as it were, multi-ethnic who took on a, a, a common name for the community. And what they were was anti-slavery, no matter what, which was different from having been freed off these boats. And in some cases, the, the British ships would intercept ships that didn't have any captives in them, but were obviously outfitted or furnished for captivity. I mean, you could tell. You could tell by how much food was in the ship, what the ship was for or the arrangement of the, the decks, right? So all of this is the case. But here's the point is that that abolition was a police action that did not result in making freedom for the people who had been captives in the ships. One and two, quite often, there were deals between, say, Netherlands, the Dutch, yeah, Netherlands, uh, Brazil slave traders, some Spanish slave traders, some Portuguese slave traders, and some Angolan slave traders for the Brits to kind of look the other way, right? So more of the same with police. So I say all of these things to say that while I and others have come to expect the word abolition 
to open people's minds to the possibility of life otherwise. It is also true that there's nothing magical nor inevitable in what abolition might become if we don't make it into the thing we want it to be. It isn't, it isn't something that's got an untarnished history, if you will. So some people like to complain, oh, this abolitionist 19th century white people. Other people like to complain, oh, some abolitionist in the 19th century celebrity. And other, you know, there are all kinds of reasons to complain. Fine. That's true of anything that we set ourselves out to do. We can complain about what's wrong with the categories we have decided to embrace. But what abolition still gives us, if we take it seriously, is a way of understanding that if freedom is a place, then abolition is life in rehearsal of making that place. And so it's not a police action, it's not an interception, it is everything that is in excess of the shift of, let us say, a legal category right, or a legal designation. And how we can see that now is not so much looking back to the history of captives. I've been trying to train myself to say captives instead of slaves because I really like it. Back to captives from that period of history, but rather to think about captives in the current moment and how any number of people, say in the United States and beyond, who have been in captivity because criminalized or detained by uh, border patrol, when they are de-detained, are not free either. That there are all kinds of documentary and other uh, weights on them that continue to uh, suppress their ability to enjoy the, the space time they have left to themselves, whether it's prohibitions against employment, whether it's automatic deportation, whatever it is, that all of this gives us some sense that abolition is something far in excess of shifting the legal category and certainly can never be reduced or displaced to somehow some kind of police function. What an amazing conversation. I am so grateful for Ruthie and for her insights, which have informed so much work. I also appreciate the urgency of discussing time as it relates to extraction, because as we have repeatedly been warned, we are running out of time, and extraction is the reason why. We have also been told we only have three years to transform our relationship with the natural world. And sadly, the scholarship in those reports takes so long to get approval and gets run through such a political filter that our situation is likely even more dire. We are all experiencing the theft of time. As the world becomes less habitable and more people are displaced, we are living in a collapsing box where borders and the extraction of time redraw boundaries of habitability and survival. And more and more people find themselves zoned into death worlds and sacrifice zones. On a long enough timeline under capitalism, the entire world is a sacrifice zone. Bordering, partitioning, and extraction are the apocalypse. Prisons and other sites of detention are the hyper embodiment of these phenomena and of what they do to human bodies as well as the natural world. The struggle for abolition is a fight for the future. It is the work of making place and defiance of bordering and extraction. It is a refusal to experience collapse on the oppressor's terms because when it comes to who we can save and what we can heal, the exploration of our collective potential has barely begun. 
can we build new worlds together that cannot be crushed or contained by the collapsing box of carcerality? I believe that work is already happening and that it is up to each of us to find our place and to see what must be grown. I want to thank Ruth Wilson Gilmore for talking with me about abolition and all of these subjects that mean so much to us both. Ruthie, I am grateful for your friendship and your wisdom, and I am so glad you are in the world. I hope everyone will check out Abolition Geography, Essays Toward Liberation, A collected assemblage of Ruthie's writings over the course of decades is such a gift to us all, and I hope people will grab onto that opportunity. The book is currently available for pre-order through Verso Books, and you can find the link to that, along with some of Ruthie's other work and interviews, in the show notes of this episode on our website at truthout.org. I also want to thank our listeners for joining us today, and remember, our best defense against cynicism is to do good and to remember that the good we do matters. Until next time, I'll see you in the streets. Thank you for listening to Movement Memos. This show wouldn't exist if it weren't for Truth Out, and Truth Out's independent news and commentary wouldn't exist without listeners and readers like you. We have no paywalls, no corporate sponsors, and no ads, except for fundraising appeals like this one. So if you can and would like to support our work, please consider dropping by truthout.org to make a donation today.